topic is the history of submarine warfare along the Jersey Shore. But what we do is we start a little bit with um, a few associations of New Jersey with submarines, going all the way back to David Bushnell's turtle. And, and historians remember this as a the failed attempt to use a submarine to sink British ships in New York Harbor. And uh, what, how it ended up in New Jersey was um, after the Americans fled New York, they um, put it on a ship and brought it to New Jersey. The ship sunk. And so now the remains, if there are any left, of the uh, uh, Bushnell's Turtle are at the base of the George Washington Bridge. What you see on the left there is um, a model of the turtle uh, that was the property of uh, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Remember, he was Secretary of the Navy at one time. So, okay, this is in the New York, uh, New Jersey National Guard Museum, and it is a submarine. It's called the Intelligent Whale. The Intelligent Whale was developed during the Civil War because both sides were looking for submarines, the Confederates to break the blockade, and the Union to be able to get in and remove the roadblocks and shell the city of Charleston and other Confederate cities. So this one, um, a guy named Merriam from Connecticut came up with it and uh, he got some investors from New Jersey to fund it and they built it in, in New Jersey. And so we ended up with it because uh, the Navy contacted us some years back and said they didn't have any room for this anymore. And it was a New Jersey identified artifact did we want it? So we said, yes. And therein lies the rest of the story with this guy, Oliver Halstead. Oliver Halstead was probably the, the biggest full-time lobbyist during the Civil War. He was from New Jersey. He had a rather sketchy reputation as an attorney, uh, also uh, in the gold rush of 1849. And he, um, he went, to, he went down to Long Branch in, in the summer of 1861 and got to talking up uh, with uh, Mary Lincoln's um, entourage and, and, and got, a, got a place in there and got down to DC and then started uh, lobbying for ammunition makers, gun makers, ship makers, whatever. So Halstead got the, um, uh, the, the intelligent whale contract from the Jersey investors and he, he could sell anything, but he couldn't sell the oil. So what happens is uh, they test it in 1864 in, uh, in the Hudson River, and it goes down, it comes up, a diver comes out of it, uh, and the Navy looks at it, and they look at some of the other stuff they've tried, and they said, nah, I think we'll pass. So what is Oliver going to do? He can't, can't sell this thing, you know, so he buys it. And in 1866, he, he first of all, he tries to sell it to the Fenians uh, in, in 1866 after the war. That doesn't work out. And then he, um, he successfully sells it to the Navy at a discount. They bring it to Brooklyn. They put it on the commander's lawn and they, they test it once it doesn't work. So they, they say, well, call that guy uh, Halstead in Newark. He knows, uh, you know, he knows how, uh, how it works. And, uh, Unfortunately, Oliver, this is by 1870, 71, he's dead because he had an affair with a lady and her other boyfriend showed up and shot him in Newark on July the 4th. Uh, so the Navy then just put it on the, on the commander's lawn as a lawn ornament and they painted it white. Here's another submarine, it looks similar, but this one actually worked. Uh, John Holland was an Irishman who came through, emigrated to, uh, to Massachusetts first and then New Jersey, where he became a teacher in Patterson. And his brother was a, was a, a, a big wheel in the Fenian organization, which was the Irish uh, Republican Brotherhood's American branch. And they were always looking to, to do something to the English to gain Irish independence. So a submarine seemed like a good idea because the British fleet was huge and um, they, didn't, they had nothing. So. Uh, Holland was just fooling around. He invented a little submarine that he tried out in Patterson uh, by the falls, and uh, it seemed to sort of work. And so he went to the Fenians and he said, well, you guys put up the money and I'll build you a real submarine. So they did, he did, and this was the result. 
and it was called the, the newspapers knew who put the money up, even though it was never publicly say, stated. Uh, it was the, called the Fenian Ram. So what happens? Well, the Fenians, like many other revolutionary organizations, start fighting amongst themselves. And one faction steals the submarine, which is in Jersey City at the time, and brings it over to Long Island, where they put it in a barn because they, they tow it, actually. They don't know how to use it. And it stays there. Now, that gets Holland outraged, and he goes to the Fenians and said, you guys are just terrible, and I'm not going to do business with you anymore. I'm going to do business only with American capitalists. So when do we see the submarine again? Well, we see it in 1916, after the um, uprising in Dublin on Easter Sunday, and they bring it out and put it in Madison Square Garden. That's a tourist attraction, and you, you can contribute a quarter to the welfare of the Irish rebels there. When that's over with, it goes up to a high school in the Bronx. And then in 1923, I believe it is, they, uh, a guy from Patterson buys it and says it started in Patterson and it's got to come back to Patterson. So he brings it back and they, they, they store it down by the river. And this is how this picture was taken in the early 20th century. And eventually it's moved uh, and now it's in the Patterson Museum. But it was a great, great photo target for people to go down and get their picture taken with the with the submarine. This is Holland's other submarine. The one that had several varieties, but th this one actually succeeded and was bought by the United States Navy uh, as the first submarine they purchased. And you see Holland there in the corner, looking up out of the out of the um, the hatch. And uh, 1909, they bought it. Holland dies in 1914. And when he dies, his obituary in the New York Times says, well, his invention, and there were other people who had similar inventions, uh, will see a lot of use in this upcoming war, we think. And well, they were right. The Germans had a lot of submarines. Very few of them could reach the United States. So the Deutschland and several other boats in that classification, maybe about a dozen, were called cargo submarines. And their uh, objective was to go underneath the British fleet, come to America, which was neutral at the time, buy supplies and bring them back to Germany. And this is a picture of the crew of the Deutschland in uh, 1916 in Baltimore. And uh, you can see they, they, they started out of uh, Bremen. Now, when the United States entered the war, there was a need to retrofit these uh, cargo submarines as, as weapons. And this is one of them. Uh, the one that would come to the United States uh, in 1918 was uh, U-151. I don't know whether that this is actually U-151, but it's a similar one. It's one of the cargo submarines that was converted. Now they came to they came to this coast in New Jersey in 1918, and they dropped bombs uh, or rather mines uh, along the Delaware River and up along the coast. And this is a German mine from World War One on a submarine. And you see the framework in it that goes to the bottom and hits the bottom, and then the mine is released to bob up to the top. And then the ship hits it. There was a few mine uh, explosions on ships, uh, American ships. One, I believe, down near Cape May, uh, but not a lot. This is the guy who was responsible for most of the ship sunk in World War I off the Jersey coast. Frederick Corner, he was the boarding officer. Now, you, you always think of, uh, of um, submarine warfare as torpedoing uh, ships from undersea. Well, that's not what they did in World War I. The submarine would rise to the surface and it would signal with flags to the cargo ship that um, they should stop. When they stopped, uh, Corner would get in his, um, with his part of his crew in a small boat, go over to the ship, get on it, and they would, they would then, uh, um, he would say to the uh, captain, may I have your papers? And 
the guy would say, okay. And then he would say, well, we're going to sink this ship. So you and your crew, you get in the car, the boats here, the, you know, your rescue boats, lifeboats, and the Jersey Shore is, you know, 20 miles that way or 10 miles that way. So Corner was interviewed after the war and uh, he was always polite. And uh, one of the captains of a ship that they sunk said he was so polite, he was maddening. This is one of the ships that they sunk. They would place explosive charges all around the ship and then blow them up. And sometimes they had to fire a few rounds from their deck gun to finish the job. And these were, some of them were sailboats, actually. And one, one Sunday in 1918, seven ships were sunk on the same day. And then we got people's attention. But it became somewhat of a tourist uh, attraction. In Asbury Park, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people ran down to the boardwalk because they saw there were U.S. planes up there looking for this uh, submarine. And, it was, uh, it was entertainment. It would be far different in, in the next conflict. Here's a picture of the, uh, of, of German postcard rather, of, of the, uh, the crew leaving a ship after they have decided to blow it up. All right, on to the Second World War. In 1936, they passed the Neutrality Act which said that you, in the United States Congress, that you couldn't arm a merchant ship. But by November, 1941, uh, the war was getting hot. So they changed that and they started to arm merchant ships with a gun or two and a deck gun. And this takes place in Hoboken, which was one of the big ports that they did this in. And the interesting thing is then they assigned a Navy crew to handle a gun, and they were part of the armed guard. So uh, merchant ships had the armed guard, and, and uh, they were supposed to be able to, to combat enemy planes or submarines. So they didn't do a very good job with the submarines. When the war starts, when we get into it, Admiral Adolphus Andrews is responsible for the uh, the East Coast, which includes New Jersey, of course. And Andrews gets information, intelligence from the British who've broken the German code. And they say there's submarines on the way to, to the United States. This is in January of 1942. So Andrews petitions for boats and, and, and anti-submarine warfare uh, devices and training, and he's ignored. Why is he ignored? Well, this is one of the boats, by the way. When the United, the United States wanted PT boats in 1941, they, they sent out uh, propositions to different manufacturers and they, they got about a dozen different ones and they used them all, uh, although they only settled on one as a, a permanent. But uh, Andrews only had two of these. It's because of this guy, Ernest King. Now, King had served the, with the British as a, a U.S. naval officer in World War I, and he, uh, he didn't like them. So when the war starts after Pearl Harbor, he tells President Roosevelt and said, look, this war is going to be fought in the Pacific by the Navy, not in the Atlantic. And so we, he starts shipping ships out of the East Coast over to the... Um, the Pacific, and he ignores uh, any instructions for convoying or other uh, other uh, defensive measures along the East Coast. And so, at the end of January, what the British told uh, uh, us was came true. And there was a ship; it was a um, a Norwegian ship. And this is a German World War U-boat. Uh, and, and the, these U-boats could come all the way to America. They didn't need a cargo one. And this is the Barringer. The, the end of the uh, Barringer was a was a an oil tanker. It was a, um, a Norwegian ship. Now Norway had been conquered by the Nazis, but there was still there was Norwegian diplomats in the United States, and 
people at sea. And so we contracted with them and they, the Germans torpedoed the ship. Now, interestingly, everybody in the crew got off alive, including the crew's pet dog. And it sunk west of Atlantic City. Now, they got into lifeboats and they started pedaling, paddling towards Atlantic City, but the next month comes the RP Resource, another tanker, and that was torpedoed in February. So it burned. Uh, and uh, this picture was taken by US news people, and there was no censorship at that time. They, they went out and they hired a fishing boat, went out of Manisquan, and went out to, to see the ship a few miles offshore and took, uh, took this photo. Now, these are the guys who saved the crew of the Varen. Uh, Dewey Cacchetti and uh, Edward Elisano. Uh, they heard a boom when they were going out fishing in the morning. And when they... Uh, when they uh, heard the boom uh, and they saw a flash on the horizon and Conchetti says, something strange over there, let's go see. So they, saw, they encountered the lifeboats coming towards the shore. And uh, they, th what they did was they, they tied them up and towed them in, in, into the shore. And uh, so they, they actually saved the whole crew. And uh, for that, they were the heroes of the Varanger sinking. Here's some of the Varanger's crew, and that's the Norwegian uh, consul in Philadelphia, and from Philadelphia. This is in Gloucester City, where they're, they're photographed and they're visited by the council, consul and uh, immigration inspectors. That was the immigration center in, in uh, Gloucester City. Now, these two guys, they're the only survivors of that other sinking in February of uh, the resort. Forsdahl and Daniel Hay. Now, Forsdahl on the on the on, on the on the, uh, the right was a crewman on the ship, and Hay on the left was uh, a member of the armed guard. And this picture was taken of them at the Manisquan Coast uh, Guard station. They were so covered with oil it took like four guys to haul them into the boat rescue boat. Uh, they had to wash them down at the station, and. Uh, so these are very, these are the luckiest guys on the Jersey Shore in, in February of, of 1942. And here, here's again, uh, no censorship. Uh, a U.S. destroyer was sent down. This was, uh, this is what King had advised uh, his uh, or subordinate to do. Check it out with a submarine. So they, they went down, they passed the, the burning ship. And they were sunk by the same submarine that sunk the resort. A hundred men were lost, only 11 survived. And uh, it made the newspapers all over the country. And here you are, no censorship. This is the crew, but the only survivors, nine of them, there were 11 total. You notice these guys are sort of smiling. Some of them are not. My thought is that the, the newspaper photographer told them, look, smile, smile. And there's a couple guys there, that the two or three of them, they just couldn't do it. And uh, it was torpedoed off Cape, Cape May. Here's the Cairo. The Cairo was a Brazilian ship and it was sunk by a German submarine uh, in March of 1942. And uh, this is uh, six survivors in one body here. There were more survivors. And among them were these two ladies, uh, Mrs. Willie Saunders to Susan and her 15 year old daughter, June, and they're being interviewed uh, by the press at a hotel, the Hotel Wellington in Manhattan. Again, no censorship. This is Captain Torger also of the Gulf Trade. There's another ship that was sunk that month. Uh, and he survived, but he did not survive, as I note in the picture there, a one a collision uh, with another tanker in 1943. So now they begin to say, well, we guess, I guess we should do something here. So they start um, uh, 
getting volunteers or fishing boats to go out and look for subs, uh, yachts. I remember Ernest Hemingway down in, uh, in Cuba, was, uh, he had his uh, yacht and he was going looking for submarines. Fortunately for him, he didn't find any. Uh, these are volunteer sub spotters. Also started to bring in blimp to light Hickhurst. And uh, the K-class airships had uh, community combo equipment, instruments for, for night flying and uh, radar. And they were armed with four depth charges and a 50 caliber machine gun. And so there were 10 men in each crew. So they go up there. So things begin to change in the summer. There's a depth charge going off. By the way, with that, uh, with that destroyer, they had their depth charges on there and they had them armed before they dropped them. And so when the ship went down, when it reached a certain depth, the depth charges went off and killed more guys from that crew. Okay, so now we have New Jersey National Guard, which had been called to active duty in September of 1941 and was stationed at Fort Dix. And they did various maneuvers around here. They are on the beach at Asbury Park. Now, they start getting serious. Now, the, 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 the Navy comes up with this idea that, oh, it must be the lights from the shore that are illuminating these ships and uh, for, the, for the German torpedoes. So they go into dim out and blackout, dim out along the shore and blackout inland. This is Governor um, uh, Edison on the right. He's the son of the famed inventor. And uh, he's, he's been looking at a map in Newark where they're pointing out different uh, spots where there are uh, sirens and whistles to signal the blackout. Now this becomes uh, troublesome to uh, factories because they're, they're working overtime all night and there's a lot of flame. Uh, it also Palisades Amusement Park doesn't want to do it. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of controversy around this and uh, you know, you say now today, well, who uh, who would have thought German airplanes would be attacking New Jersey? Well, Edison apparently thought the possibility was there because he went up to his father's uh, uh, laboratory in, in West Orange and he uh, uh, he he dug a, a, a pit and and covered it with concrete. It's still there to put his father's records in, in case the place was bombed. I think they thought that early in the war that maybe the Germans would get to Greenland and they come down from there. Of course, by 1944, that was all uh, legend. Now, uh, the United Seamen Service and the War Shipping Administration had a rest center at Gladstone, New Jersey for seamen who ships have been torpedoed. And here you see the Duke and Duchess of Windsor who chatted with them and signed autographs. And of course, the Duke of uh, Windsor was um, the former brief king, and he was actually, with, he was pretty friendly with the Germans. So when the war started, they exiled them sort of to the governorship of an island in the, the Bahamas. So in order to do his part for the war, he used to come to New Jersey. Here's another aside. Uh, New, New Jersey Governor Walter Wally Edge. Uh, he's the only New Jersey governor to be governor within two wars. Yeah, he took office in January 44, succeeding Edison. And here, uh, Harold and Cheryl Meyer of Newark was, was appointed uh, pinup queen of the USS New Jersey in 1945. And he's, yeah, politicians always seem to scare kids. You see, she's not exactly enthralled with this. As the war settled down uh, and there were less and less uh, submarine attacks, they really end by the late summer of 1942. Uh, nobody's gonna know that at the time, but they do because the Germans are now going to concentrate on uh, ships, transports, hauling supplies and troops to uh, Europe. And so the shore starts to open up again. Uh, Bradley Beach Dad's Club here was a uh, serviceman on leave, could go in, that's right on the beach. And uh, I think another thing, there was a big controversy between, of course, the Navy and 
who in the uh, in the state, and the Navy kept complaining the state wasn't doing their part, especially on the shore. So Governor Anderson got his um, his uh, defense guy and his uh, um, his chief of the state police put them on a boat and they went down the sh- down the coast, and they reported to him, and he, he they said. Every place was dark, a little bit of light from Atlantic City. So then when we got to Cape May, the naval station there was lit up like a Christmas tree. And uh, the, 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 uh, the chief, chief of the state police said, yes. And uh, my, my guy stopped uh, several uh, Navy officers driving with their headlights on. So uh, it, it eventually petered out. But the Navy was just trying to find excuses for their own lack of performance because, and then they're talking about the, the silhouette of the submarine. Well, when the, when the, uh, the, uh, Barringer was shot, it was sunk out of sight ashore. And, uh, the resort was shot with the submarine between the shore and it. So there wouldn't have been any silhouette. So. And here's Bradley beach in 1943. People are back on the beaches. Now there's a lot of crap on the beaches too. There's tar from sunken ships. I knew a, a gentleman who was a kid during the war and he actually found a lifeboat on the, on the beach empty and he rummaged around and found a 45 automatic pistol which he brought home as a souvenir. So, uh, but these ladies, including my, my uh, former uh, mother-in-law, uh, Fran Ziegler was the second from the left uh, we're on the beach at Bradley Beach. This is Ocean Grove, a quiet community in 1944. And you can see very quiet, no, no problems. Now, there are a lot of legends on the Jersey Shore about, oh, submarines. I, I wanted to talk to one guy and he said, well, you know, my, my, uh, my grandfather was fishing and in the Raritan Bay and a submarine came up to the surface and they, they said hi to him and then they left. And then, and then the, the other was uh, that there were Germans landing in, in rubber boats and, and buying groceries in local stores, hardly likely. Uh, number one, there were no showers or bath facilities on submarines. So these guys in their clothes would have stunk like hell. They didn't speak English. And they wouldn't know where to go to a grocery store if they landed. So, you know, all those myths came up over the years. Now, they're based, I think, in the reality of, of submarines landing two groups of four each saboteurs, one on Long Island and one in Florida. And the guy that they were supposed to uh, contact with was a guy in Newark, New Jersey, Emil Ludwig Krepper. He was a former Lutheran minister who is now a bookkeeper for a couple of bars in Newark. And they were supposed to reunite when you unite with him and he would uh, provide them with quarters and some American money. Now the people that they chose in Germany were, were people who had lived in this country. Uh, after World War I, a lot of Germans left because it was a mess. Then when Hitler came to power and it looked like they were getting, becoming great again, they went back. And so these guys knew like American slang and they knew sports and things like that. So they were ones that were picked. Um, fortunately, we captured all of them and uh, most of them were executed actually. Uh, and I think there was one or two that were left that were deported to Germany after the war. Uh, Krupper was caught and sentenced to prison and he did get out of prison and, uh, and survived. So that's it. That's the story. And uh, it's a, one that has not been really talked about a lot, except for those uh, Germans going uh, shop, shopping in the grocery stores uh, and down here for a long time. And when we came out with the book, people were surprised. Uh, at, uh, then they were also surprised that the submarine sinking stopped in the late summer of 1942. And at that point, in the last one of the last ones, a teacher down South Jersey brought her class out to the uh, out to the shore to watch the plane. Now, but now we had planes, we had blimps, we had ships. Everybody chasing the submarine, so they made good in the end. Thank you.